they occupied every corner of Tibet and progressively they uh, spread the communist rule over, over Tibet. Welcome to the gist on Strat News Global. I'm Ramananda Sen Gupta. A very, very special guest today, all the way from Oroville, is Mr. Claude Arpi, a dear old friend of mine and an authority on Tibet. He probably forgotten more about Tibet than you and I will ever learn. Thank you so much for joining us, Claude. And, you know, let me just quickly explain why we have you here today so that, uh, you know, we can put it into context. Essentially, 65 years ago today, the Dalai Lama entered India. What has changed since then is what we're going to talk to Claude about. Thank you, Claude, for joining us. It's good to have you and it's good to see you. So, you know, Claude, let's start right in the beginning. That, you know, when the Dalai Lama came into India before that, if you could just very briefly tell us the incidents that actually led to his arrival here and, you know, the time frame involved. Very briefly, if you could, you know, just explain what led to him actually coming here. The Chinese uh, troops, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, entered into Tibet in uh, October 1950, and they reached Lhasa, the Tibetan capital, in September 51. And from 51 till 59, they occupied every corner of Tibet, and progressively they uh, spread the communist rule over, over Tibet. Tibet was a religious country. Uh, it was a new religion, Marxism, and it didn't fit very well with uh, uh, the Tibetan religion and the Tibetan culture. So ultimately, to just to cut a long story short, in uh, March of 1959, um, the Chinese had planned to do more reforms, what they call reforms, but uh, in, with a name it means indoctrination and uh, uh, forcing the uh, communism in the throat of the Tibetan, there was a revolt. It's, and on the 10th mm -hmm. of March is a uprising day for the Tibetan because uh, the Dalai Lama was the supreme leader, religious and temporal leader of Tibet, was invited by, on that day by the commandant of the Tibet military region to come to his own camp for a so-called theater show. So the population of Lhasa uh, revolted and decided not to let the Dalai Lama go. And what was interesting, because today, uh, we, I mean, not on 28th of March, uh, China mm -hmm. is celebrating the self-emancipation day. They said one million serfs have been emancipated. Thereafter, they were free. But what is interesting on this uprising of uh, 10 March is that the entire population of Lhasa surrounded the summer palace of the Dalai Lama. And it was really, uh, in communist uh, terminology, it's a mass uh, rebellion uh -huh. again, again. And it's not the clergy or it's not the aristocracy who revolted against the, the Chinese rule. It is the, the masses, the, the entire population, we would say, the common man today in uh, Indian term terminology. But um, that's very, very interesting because it means that it's ordinary people who didn't want anymore. So they stopped the Dalai Lama to uh, leave his uh, palace and uh, things were getting worse. And Chinese had started uh, bombing uh, the Nobolinka, the summer palace, and on the 17th, uh, Dalai Lama had no choice but to leave Tibet. So, uh -huh. and he decided, uh, after take, consulting his oracle, to take the di direction of India and not the normal direction. Normal direction would have been to go south, uh, the Chumbi Valley and Sikkim. It was the usual trade route or pilgrim route. But he decided to go more uh, toward the east and to go the Tsona. Um, route and cross in Tawang, what is Tawang, mm -hmm. uh, to the Tawang district. And uh, it was uh, the Kamang Frontier Division, it was called at that time. So okay. he crossed the border 
65 years ago. So all this... Uh, uh, I'll interrupt you for a second. How long did this journey from, you know, the palace to uh, the border take? And how difficult was that journey? Uh, the, uh, to the, um, he left at, in the night mm -hmm. of 17 March and he reached uh, one uh, small village called Lunce, which is, uh, I mean, it was the largest village on, on the border, and uh, on 26, so in nine days. And he crossed most of the Loka area, which was under the control of the Kampa guerrilla. So that way it was more or less safe. But the Chinese couldn't really follow him. And he reached, uh, once he reached uh, Lunce, he sent a message to Prime Minister Nehru, ask him for asylum for is um, for himself and for his people. At that time, there was only a small group of 80 people. It means uh, his family, his younger brother, his mother, uh, his two tut tutors, and tw three senior ministers, and his security guards, which was mostly the uh, Campa guerrilla. So all these people asked for asylum and immediately uh, Nehru uh, accepted and sent the officer who was posted in Tawang. Uh, his de designation was um, APO, Assistant Political Officer. He was Mr. T.S. Murti, he was a Chinese speaking officer, very uh, erudite, uh, a great scholar of, on the history of the, of the border. So he was sent to receive the Dalai Lama in the place called Chutangmu, who was the first. Um, post of the 5th Battalion of the Assam Rifles who were guarding the border. The uh, uh -huh. real border was a few kilometers uh, north in one place called Kenzimane. Mani means prayer wheel. So there was a small prayer wheel and mm -hmm. that, that's the place he really entered India. But a few kilometers later, he was received by Mr. T.S. Mani and the Assam rifle. And some of these Assam rifle, till recently, were still alive, and they went to meet His Holiness in Dharamsala. I see. Oh, you know, you, there's also somewhere I remember you mentioning that there was the stick which he planted somewhere, and that turned into a tree or something. So uh, that stick uh, has grown into a tree, and it's in Kenzimane. It's a, a few kilometers before uh, Chutangmu. And you can see the trees. I mean, the people who are guarding the border, the ITBP and the army, as well as uh, some pilgrims who are going there, uh, have put prayer flags and there's a small stupa and there's a plate. Because what is interesting, that this very historic place where His Holiness entered India is also the place where the first battle took place in October of 1962. The 7th Brigade of uh, Brigadier John Dalvi, it took mm -hmm. place exactly at the same place. So, uh, that uh, well, it's no, very interesting. interesting. I, I had the opportunity to go, go there, and you can see the uh, Tagla Ridge, which is very famous in the history of uh, 62, where, and the Namkachu, where all the Indian uh, 7th Brigade were, was posted that got. Uh, decimated in a few, few hours and the uh, Atungla, the, the, the other uh, ridge on the other side of the Namkachu. So you can see both the historic place where His Holiness entered uh, the India and took refuge. And since 65 is a refugee, not only a refugee, Nehru said you'll be an honored guest in that country. And it has been repeated by the uh, successive government of India, he's been always an honored guest. He's uh, living in Dharamsala, but wherever he moves in India, the government of India organized for his, uh, his security and is uh, looking mm -hmm. after him. You know, that brings me to a point that, you know, which I remember again in one of your articles, it says that the fact, the very fact that the Chinese did not cross into um, Arunachal or in those days, you know, um, um, where, the, where the Dalai Lama had crossed in from. I, I think it's very, they didn't really see India at Arunachal as part of their own territory. Now, you know, uh, just you know, this day, uh, the Chinese spokesperson in Beijing keep repeating uh, again and again that uh, southern Tibet 
uh, now uh, uh, Shandan, they call that is part of China. It has always been part of China, but right. it's absolutely untrue. And I think uh, EM, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, the external affairs minister, as well as a spokesman of the MEA, have in the strongest term has denied that it was part. But if you look at 59, March 59, now the Dalai Lama stayed two, three days at Lonsay, the last village. He crossed over and he is received by the uh, Assam rifle. Now, mm -hmm. between the time he crossed on 31st uh, of March and the time he reached Tezpur in the plane, the 17 days. Okay. He stayed uh, stay one or two days in uh, this one big stupa, uh, Gosam stupa uh, near uh, the border. After he stayed in Lumlad, which is the first vill big village where he was uh, received by the political officer, Mr. Armanda Singh who came from Bundela after he stayed for five days in uh, Tawang. And interestingly, in Tawang, he, uh, there was a guard of honor by the Assam rifle. So Chinese were furious about that, what they got to learn later. But later on, he moved to Bundela and finally to Tezpur. 17 days, there is no Chinese. They have not even complained that he has, uh, uh, Dalai Lama is in our country. If it, if it was true what they're saying today, they would have followed him and you know, catch up, catch up in. Exactly. They that's what, you know, that's I think, what, what your thing says. But, you know, Claude, if we come back to events post that in the past 65 years, what do you think would be the most dramatic change that has taken place in the you know, relationship, if you could call it a sort of a triangular thing with the Dalai Lama and India and China? Has there been any dramatic shift in position from any one of these three entities? Or have they all remained the same Polit since Politically, no, uh, not really from the government of India in the sense that uh, uh, after reaching Tezpur, a special train took His Holiness to Mussoorie. He was kept for a few months in Mussoorie because uh, Dharamsala was only... Um, arranged a few months later. So in Missouri, some uh, first week of May, Nehru came, my minister came and spent four hours with the Dalai Lama. And he told him very clearly, I will look after your people. I will rehabilitate your people. I will look, educate your children, but I will, uh, I will not, uh, politically, India will not stand by you. Uh, Got it. Today, uh, uh, Tibetan have been very well looked after in terms of education and rehabilitation. I think they are doing uh, quite well. And but in political term, nothing much has been done. And of course, the last few years, the government has taken a very a much stronger position vis-à-vis -vis, uh, China, especially after Doklam and more so after. Uh, May 2020, the incident in Eastern Ladakh. So mm -hmm. uh, the position has slightly changed, but uh, the, the Central Tibetan administration in in Dharamsala has never been recognized by by the government of India. Though in 1965, when the, Mr. Shastri, Lalbado Shastri, uh, had to go to Tashkent to negotiate with the uh, Russian and the Pakistani. He called the Dalai Lama's envoy, Mr. Chakapa, in, uh, in the PMO, and he told him, when I come back from Tashkent, I will recognize your government. That he, oh. never, he, never, he never came back. Exactly. So the uh, issue is that the China is keep saying every day, uh, so, uh, the entire Arunachal is uh, ours. That is nonsense. They have never been there. Uh, Arunachali or the earlier the tribes have never seen a Chinese, but uh, so it's just propaganda. But by repeating again and again and again this propaganda, they think that one day uh, people will will accept it. I don't think the government will accept. But the fact is that this border, this McMahon line, has been signed in 1914 by the um, Tibetan Prime Minister Lochun Chetra and uh, the Foreign Secretary of India, Sir Henry McMahon, and they have put their seal and sign. So the border agreement is between independent Tibet and, uh, and British India. 
So to, since uh, 1914, I mean, especially after uh, 59, uh, 62, the government of India has always stood by that line and today uh, uh, Delhi is, stand, is standing by that line. But that line has been signed by one uh, independent, independent Tibet. So sometimes they will have to reconcile something, uh, the government. And, uh, hmm. but, That's uh, true, but you know, the point remains that um, in so many years, the border has still, nothing has really changed other than the fact that apparently, you know, the Chinese are still trying very hard to stake claim to more places, as many places as they can. Um, you know, coming back to the Dalai Lama, many years ago, I remember that there was a, a young, well, I won't say young, I think he was about 40, but he was with the Tibetan Youth Congress. He immolated himself in Jantar Mantar in Delhi. And I was in that neighborhood and I happened to just be there. And I remember a whole bunch of these Tibetan Youth Congress people who had come all the way from the US and various other Western countries as well, saying that, you know, we are sticking to the middle path simply because the Dalai Lama is saying so and we respect him too much. But after he is gone, we have the wherewithal and the money to actually arm ourselves and take a slightly more aggressive position on Tibet. How far do you think that is a valid thing and what are the implications of that? I'm it's very difficult to predict the future. The Tibetan Lama, they were good. They were doing with dice like that. They could tell you the future. So I will not, not uh, tell you, but I think it's right in one way that uh, Dalai Lama has been a cooling factor and China has never recognized or acknowledged or wanted to know that. But without the Dalai Lama, it would have really uh, turn much more violent. So the Lama has violent. managed in 65 years. Okay, vis-a-vis -vis the government of India, there's very little change. S slow change, slow change, but not. But he has managed to bring together all the three province, uh, traditional province, Kham, Hamdo, Utsang, all the people he has brought. Without him today, they would, uh, everyone would start uh, maybe uh, uh, this. Uh, fighting or like that. And he has brought also all the different um, religious schools, including the Bon faith, the original faith in Tibet. So together. Mm -hmm. So uh, which was not the case in, in Tibet. So right. this uh, now for the so political solution, I don't know if it's feasible when he speaks about middle path and working with China, because everyone has, especially since two, three years, not only in India. India, we have seen it more because of uh, Doklam and, uh, and the Ladakh right. confrontation. But everywhere in the world, people realize that China is not the Eldorado that people were thinking of and that we, we can do business like usual. They keep stealing your uh, whatever you find in, in terms of R&D. Uh, and uh, now more and more the, the Western countries of course, first the U United States, because for them it's a big competition, but also more recently the European Union and other countries. Uh, I've realized that China is a toughy. China is expansionist country. Uh, everyone has seen it in the South China Sea and even um, countries like France. Now I've taken a very strong stand and they, uh, they have this uh, concept of Indo-Pacific and uh, they side with India, uh, knowing that this uh, sea lane should be preserved and it doesn't belong to anybody. What China has done in, uh, with a nine dot uh, line in the South China Sea, uh, the Western country, and as well as uh, Japan, Australia, and other countries, uh, uh, Vietnam, are able to, to see it very concretely. When it happens in Ladakh, in Eastern Ladakh, or in uh, Yangtze sector in uh, Arunachal, uh, nobody really cares or nobody uh, can, it's too far away, no? But here, the interest of the transportation or thing is uh, of the West, mm -hmm. is stuck. So everyone sees, or when your uh, new design is stolen, when your uh, ministry is hacked, you realize that China is not, not a normal country. 
in a right. country who has his uh, defense minister and the foreign minister, which disappears for four or five months. Mm -hmm. And nobody knows where they are. And the government refused to say what happened to them. That is not a normal country. So you know, I'm saying this, even for the Tibetan, that um, the, to have a deal with China today is very difficult. And to have a deal with China, you need a lot of cards in your hand. True. But, you know, I remember reading somewhere that the Dalai Lama had been invited to visit Beijing and that he might even actually thinking of actually visit, taking that visit. What happened to that plan? I don't think he was in, he, he was invited. He wanted, Dalai Lama always wanted to go to one place called Wute Chan, who is a mountain which is dedicated to Manjushri. So since uh, he mm -hmm. has come in exile, he always wanted. To, so I think it, there was some uh, uh, discussion. I mean, not open discussion, but. Or uh, allowing him to visit. The, it was discussed and the possibility, but I think they realized that it was uh, very difficult or not impossible because uh, China would have used and the Tibetan people also do not trust enough China to let the Dalai Lama go uh, to to China today. Will he come back? Uh, who is going to uh, give uh, security? They trust the security that the government of India can give. Yes, that plus mm -hmm. category. Everyone will, would trust that. But uh, what what about the security that he would uh, get if he goes right. to Wuhan or to Beijing? So I think it collapsed. But it was, it was better that it collapsed, in my views. Mm -hmm. But you know, Claude, sixty-five years in India, and he's what eighty plus. I mean, for sure, and he's already I mean closer to thing. Um, people do keep talking about his succession and things like that. But he has made it even more. Ambiguous by saying that there might not be a successor, there might be a woman as a successor. So, uh, what is all that about? I, I don't know uh, the reason that he has given, uh, he has made this declaration. But I think the only, the the serious one. Sometimes he's joking with a journalists also, and they take right, it very course, seriously. So um, uh, the only serious uh, declaration he has made is it. Uh, 2011, he made a long statement and um, he explained the different possibility. One possibility is the traditional reincarnation. When the boy dies after a couple of years, uh, you start looking for his reincarnation according to the sign that he has left, either in a written form, in a letter, or uh, through oracles or through. In Tibet, it was through a lake called La, La Moila, so where the, the people responsible for the search would go have a vision. It was happened for the uh, 14th Dalai Lama, the regent went there and he had a vision. And that is one, that is a traditional. Another um, less traditional is the emanation, uh, the possibility of uh, the Dalai Lama to uh, Emanate. I mean, I don't know practically what it means for, because I don't have the spiritual knowledge to tell you. But maybe something like the Chankaracharya in Kanchipuram is select a junior Chankaracharya who is uh, trained, groomed, and who gets all the necessary initiation. So that was the second. So uh, Dalai Lama had said in 2011 that at the age of 90, he will be 90 on uh, July 6, uh, 2025, means in one year from now. So he will uh, give uh, the way he has decided. It is absolutely clear that it is his decision. It's not China's decision or America's decision or even uh, India's decision. But in the case of India, India has a lot of uh, stakes into it because the entire Himalayan population, if you take from Ladakh to the Monpa in Tawang to uh, Eastern uh, Arunachal to uh, Walong sector, you know, they are all Buddhist and the uh, Dalai Lama, uh, they follow the old Dalai Lama. So there's a large population and it's important also for India to have some to know what is going to happen so that the population also are not disturbed because they are the border population. And it's a great advantage if he uh, takes both that side that uh, 
Uh, otherwise, China will manipulate and make him do right. any sort of right. statement, and that that would be. It. But he said very clearly, as long as Tibet is not free, he will not take birth in Tibet. So this mm -hmm. we can open. Hopefully, in one year time, we will get more uh, clear about lady and everything. It's just I think it was a joke with a journalist, and but te technically, it's it, it's possible. Mm -hmm. There's some lady, no, lady no. Lama, no. some lady reincarnated. Right. Right. But, you know, I have a whole bunch of questions lined up for you, but perhaps, you know, I'll ask them when I meet you next. You're running out of time. So let me just conclude with the last question that, you know, in all your talks, in all your uh, sort of, you know, research that you put out, I noticed that you've always ended on a slightly hopeful note, even though you express sadness over what has happened in Tibet. There's always been that slightly hopeful note Saying that you know it's it's what the what we would say in Hindi kahani abhi bhi baki hai. It's not yet the end of the show. Could you just tell us where that hope comes from? When you live, you have to you have to have hope. Otherwise, when you see the world around, when you see the corruption, what you see the what's happening to the environment, you you have a tendency to lose, lose hope. But we we should always hope for a better world, and. Uh, so I think it will be better, but it it will come not by a war with China or by a, once Dalai Lama and I think it was eighty five or eighty six. I met him in Delhi and he he joked. He said, "One million Tibetan, uh, one billion Chinese. How, it's better to be non-violent." No, he told me. He said very practical. Oh. No? <laughs> but mm -hmm. today many things are happening to China. If you look. Uh, especially after the, the recent uh, uh, two session, the, the National People's Congress, and uh, there's a lot of restrictions. For example, the prime minister couldn't give his uh, usual, the, the traditional uh, interaction with the journalist, the press conference. Many, many small details like that, which tends to say that China is not in a very, very good condition. Of course, their propaganda is, has never been so good. We can see it when they claim every day, they claim Arunachal, or when they claim that one million serfs have been um, liberated in Tibet. 65 years later, they have been liberated from what? From oh, what? You true. ask any Tibetan, from what have you been liberated 65 years ago? Mm -hmm. So uh, this China has a lot of problems. Uh, the third plenum, which was supposed to discuss, the Central Committee was supposed to come with all the big shots to discuss the, the economic issues, has been postponed and postponed. It, should, it was to be in October, November. After it was supposed to be in March, it never happened. So it shows that China has a lot of problems. And when you have to remove your, very, your rocket force, you know, who deal also with nuclear, when you have to remove the five, six top um, officials there, uh, you replace them by people who have no knowledge of the, about the rocket because they come from the Navy. So you have a problem. China has problem, many, many problems. So I think my hope comes from the fact that China will not uh, remain at it, as it is today. And only this uh, will give a hope for the Tibetan to have more freedom and to be able to practice their religion, to 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 speak in their own language. Can you imagine mm -hmm. that in Tibet today, since uh, 65 years, since uh, time uh, the His Holiness has gone, there's not a single um, party secretary which has been Tibetan. What would happen? I'm living in Tamil Nadu. What would happen if uh, the, the government, the local government and the local assembly would be run by uh, someone fr uh, from uh, Bengal or, or Rajasthan? And this right. for 50 or 60 years. It would happen. For one day, there would be a revolution. But the Tibetan True. today, they are in a, in a much more difficult uh, position. They, they are monitored so tightly by the Chinese uh, uh, police that it's very difficult to do anything but uh, they can see what uh, Tibetan on the other side of the Himalaya or in America their freedom that, that they have 
and they can put a photo of the Dalai Lama. You can't put a photo of the Dalai Lama today in Tibet. So with not a single leader has been uh, Tibetan. The party secretary is always a Han. Mm -hmm. Similarly for the People's Liberation Army, the army, there is no uh, the senior position in the army, general who the who have an operational post, they never been from uh, from uh, Tibetan or from other minorities. I understand that, but I'd still like to sort of conclude on the hopeful note that you had presented that, you know, one must always remain hopeful. So on that uh, positive note, I'd like to end this discussion for today. Thank you so much, Claude. I really appreciate your taking time out for us and I look forward to having you with us again. Thank you. Thank you. That was Claude R.P., eminent Tibetologist, Sinologist, and as I said earlier, somebody who's probably forgotten more about Tibet than you and I will ever learn, talking to us about 65 years since the Dalai Lama's arrival in India, what has changed since then, and what keeps him hopeful. I do hope you enjoyed this particular episode of The Gist. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Till we meet again, this is Ramananda Sengupta signing off.